Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar from the Said Business School and HEC Paris. The webinar is Change in a Digital World and we are joined today by two individuals who are former graduates of the Consulting and Coaching for Change programme, Cecile Demely and Eileen Lee Laverne. Both of us, you'll hear from both of them rather later on today. Um, firstly, Cecile will be giving the presentation on change in the digital world and how we can address the challenges that are presented to businesses across the globe. And then we'll go to Eileen where we'll hear from her experience and her thoughts on Cecile's presentation. And then after that point, there'll be an opportunity for people to ask questions of both Cecile and Eileen with regards to their experience on the Consulting and Coaching for Change program. It is a joint program run by the Said Business School at Oxford and HEC in Paris. And the modules run between both Paris and from Oxford. So it's a really interesting program and very unique in its kind. So you'll get a chance to ask questions about the program and about the presentation. I would encourage you to raise questions throughout the webinar. You can do so by typing them into the questions box on the right hand side of the panel. And then I will take those questions at the end or if there's a suitable point in between the conversation between Cecile and Eileen. And then if we do run out of time at the end, if there's additional questions, I can send responses to everyone attending today um, for those um, sort of fuller answers to help you with understanding this particular in really interesting and engaging topic and also more about the programme itself. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Cecile for her to talk to you about change in a digital world. Hello, Cecile. Welcome. Thank you, Gemma. Um, thank you. Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so my name is Cecile de Mailly. I am a consultant. Uh, I usually deal with uh, technology adoption and the human side of technology adoption. Uh, before being a consultant, I was a corporate person. I worked for IBM, for AT&T, and for G, uh, big American multinational companies. And when I started my uh, consultancy, I took the CCC uh, and I graduated in uh, 2010. Uh, so what I will um, speak about today uh, is change in a digital world. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, um, area, as you can uh, imagine. And Gemma, I'm sorry, I cannot. Yes, I can move the slide. Sorry for that. Um, <clears throat> so it's a very it's a very uh, interesting area, uh, but the, the very first question everybody can ask is, uh, is it really uh, what we are going to speak today? Is it about uh, a toolbox for change, or is it about the society change? And there's kind of a paradox there because, uh, of course, there's uh, it's a tremendous toolbox for change, and you have uh, a way to reach people. You have uh, uh, rich tools like uh, image, video, uh, sound, uh, uh, everything uh, digital, but at the same time you can only use them if uh, your corporation or your organization is ready to use them. And your organization will be ready to use them when uh, it has adopted the, the tools. So there's kind of a paradox there, there's kind of a chicken or egg uh, paradox. Uh, to be able to make the most of it, you have to uh, adopt it. So what does it mean for organization? Uh, you have a slide here that I did develop during my uh, dissertation in 2009, um, which is a kind of a map of the different tools that can be used in an organization for change uh, that are digital tools. So you see uh, ranges from uh, collaboration, which means creating things together, uh, to communities, which means sharing, sharing uh, with others. Uh, it can be both internal tools or external tools, uh, and it really um, basically um, interests all the areas of, uh, of the organization. So it's, it's really very rich. So this is about tools, but how does it hit uh, the human side of the organization? And that's what really interests me. 
there's basically three areas of emergence I'd like to, uh, to talk about today. Uh, the first is information and how the information flows. Um, the second is collaboration, um, how the process are transforming, and the third it's business models and disruption we're seeing everywhere. So information. Information uh, in an organization, it's structuring the organization. Uh, the traditional way uh, for the information to flow is top down through the leadership team and the middle management and management to the employees and bottom up. Um, when it goes top down, it's digested, it's explained, uh, management gives context to the employees and when it goes bottom up, uh, the, uh, the management is uh, um, building together and putting together indicators and uh, offering uh, a summary to the, the top management. Well, this uh, is uh, changing. It has been changing in the last 40 years, and it's it's changing uh, again. Uh, in the 80s and the 90s, the power in the organization was to retain or to control information. Uh, in year 2000, with the event of uh, email for everybody and digital tools um, starting to be adopted everywhere. Uh, leadership uh, has to, had to, um, to find new way to communicate and basically it was translating uh, according to the audience. Uh, the tools have made possible to uh, personalize communication. And more recently, uh, with all social technology like social network, corporate social network like uh, instant messaging and so on, um, it's more about uh, guiding uh, employees on where to find the right information and how to understand it. But it's still changing and that's the, uh, the nice picture but there's, um, there's some warnings we, we need to consider. Um, as uh, I mentioned on the slide, there's 90% of the information has been created in the last two years, so there is an increasing volume of, uh, of information around. There's even a term that has been coined for that, it's uh, infobesity. Um, it comes from uncontrolled sources, so you never know if the information is complete, you never know if the information is accurate, is true, uh, valid. Um, and also, um, well, it can happen that the employee know about things before the management do, so the management is not ready to give the context because it did not receive the context guidelines from the top management. Or, even worse, employees can know things that the management does not know and that the top management does not know. So it puts the, uh, the traditional structure of organization um, in a, a kind of difficult situation sometime. Um, I've been putting a slide here, I, I will not go uh, in detail in it, but um, I wanted to mention that because it's uh, something that has been changing the way uh, marketing people and communication people work today. It's the Blue Train Manifesto. So four consultants in 1999 put that together and they, they uh, uh, revolutionized uh, how we understand markets today. And as you see, um, the, the most powerful uh, sentence, the, the first says this is market or conversation. And this is very, very strong and this is really what is happening today. Um, there's uh, there's um, other very interesting um, thesis in, uh, in this manifesto. So you see number uh, 34 and it gives a a way for me to uh, to uh, make a transition to the next slide. It's company must share concerns of their communities. And what I wanted to uh, to talk about in the next slide, it's about collaboration. So collaboration is the second uh, area of emergence. Um, I uh, I mentioned in this presentation. Um, what is collaboration, it's building together, and how does it work? Um, thanks to the 
social technologies and digital technologies, uh, it's very easy to find people in organization or outside organization who can help with, uh, with uh, problems or um, um, were skilled for a specific issue, uh, bring expertise. Uh, so uh, it's bypassing the traditional channels of the organization. Uh, usually, uh, in in the uh, 20 years ago, you were to ask your management to find uh, somebody in the organization to help with a specific uh, problem. And today, you can just drop an email like a message in a bottle in the uh, corporate uh, social network and somebody will answer and, and, and give you a hand for, uh, for your issue. So frontiers are blurring. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good. Uh, it's very fast. Uh, it's very efficient. Uh, but from time to time, the self-organization, it means, or that happens, uh, hits the culture, the corporate culture, and corporate culture are not 100% ready for that. Um, there are some uh, corporate cultures which are very siloed, very structured, very uh, command and control uh, that really are not 100% happy with this way to, uh, to, uh, to do the work. And it also means more iteration, uh, more fuzziness. I mentioned permanent beta. Because what happened to project is that there's uh, often um, new information coming in in the in the life of a project that uh, changes everything. Uh, there's uh, you know the word serendipity. It happens for business too. Uh, so basically, um, it's very uh, difficult uh, to uh, to maintain the traditional way to do project. You have a uh, an expected outcome, a time frame, uh, a specific budget. Uh, so it's it's really uh, hitting um, the the traditional processes of the organization. The third uh, area of emergence um, is the change of business models. We have uh, lots of uh, wonderful. Um, uh, innovation like the Internet of Things, uh, uh, like disintermediation. Think about Amazon, which brings uh, books to uh, the, the the end user uh, without going through uh, a different uh, uh, seller, reseller, and so on. Um, collaborative economy. Uh, think about, for example, Airbnb, or think about Yelp uh, to help find a service. Uh, big data, artificial intelligence, uh, all of that, it's uh, changing um, the society, changing the economy, it's progress, uh, it's uh, uh, better services for, for everybody. Uh, yet, uh, and it's what we are seeing with uh, Uber and the taxi uh, drivers at the moment, uh, yet it can really change a market uh, in a very, very short time frame. Uh, it's really a sudden, unexpected, um, and uh, it uh, trigger interest from uh, from academics and researcher. And basically, what they say that 50% or more jobs and markets, of course, will disappear or mutate over the ten, the next 15 years. Um, so another warning here. Um, to give you another example uh, about big data and artificial intelligence, because it's not only um, uh, manufacturing job or, or um, um, how to say that, um, or jobs like uh, taxi driving uh, that or that can be hit. Uh, to to give you an example, it's about uh, radiology. Um, what hospital and radiologists are doing right now, it's uh, loading uh, lots of um, x-ray and their diagnosis and um, we know that um, in a few months or years, probably years, um, artificial intelligence with big data, with all these x-ray diagnoses that have been loaded will be more efficient than the human uh, person, the, the, the radiologist to predict or to diagnose uh, some cancers on some other diseases. So it's really hitting all kinds of market, all kinds of jobs. 
So I've been um, mentioning a lot of uh, warnings and caveats uh, together with a lot of progress of uh, areas of transformation. Um, the net of it for organization, corporations, is that it's a real interesting opportunity to break silos, uh, to create more uh, agile organization that uh, react faster, that are really fluent, flowing. Uh, it's also uh, an opportunity to foster engagement because uh, your employees will be involved in um, finding the right solution, um, seeing the new markets, uh, in um, being kind of a sentinel for the organization in uh, uh, picking up that the market is uh, um, going through a disruption, uh, that something new is happening. And we have uh, tools for that, like tools like crowdsourcing, like jams, like uh, open innovation hackathons, and there's a lot more. So basically, for me, what, what it means, it means uh, digital uh, word means that it helps to develop organizations' adaptability. And uh, adaptability means uh, continue to live, means uh, being more competitive, means being uh, better and being better health. So it's great. So, because we, we speak about change, I'll come back to the very uh, the, the theme of this presentation that Gemma asked me to, uh, to cover, which is change in the digital world. And how do I work with uh, my customer um, when they uh, want to um, see what digital tools can be useful for them and how they could make the most of it? Uh, what I advise them to do is really to invest transformation, take, take a deep dive, or take a dive at least. Um, and um, it means helping employees with uh, some uh, transitional tools. Uh, transitional space, by the way, is the theme, I think, of the third module of the CCC. Uh, we go through a, a bunch of uh, courses uh, on psychology, uh, uh, on uh, soci sociology, ethnography, and so on. So transitional tools, uh, it's the kind of tools that help people get in touch with a new area without uh, them being at risk. So they don't have um, uh, objectives from their management, they don't have to report anything, they just can kind of play with the new tools. So this kind of transitional tools we have, it's jams, sandboxes, uh, serious games, reverse mentorings. Uh, there is a, there's a long list to give in the, the customer. Uh, we can choose whatever uh, the best tools are. Uh, of course, you have to size uh, this, uh, this transformation depending on the organization culture, find the right level levers uh, in their culture and find uh, the, the, the right size of the project and where to start it in the organization. And when it's about change, a specific issue, a new strategy to set up, um, it's very useful, especially for what we call wicked issues, uh, for uh, those who have been through the CCC or who will do the CCC, wicked issues, it's really uh, uh, um, a concept uh, we uh, we visit and revisit all through the uh, the uh, education and the kind of issue where you don't have best practices um, you so you don't know what to do um, digital the digital world is very useful for that because it can gather um, it can help find uh, the right idea that um, you have not been thinking about. It can help find the, the right person to help. Um, it's serendipity, so it's think outside of the box, basically. Um, so it's, it's really useful for these wicked issues and this disruptive strategy. Um, it needs the organization to let go the traditional way to manage people and the traditional way to manage projects. As I said before, 
it means allowing a bit of self-organization, it means allowing project to be uh, in permanent beta stage, uh, to be iterative. Um, to give you an example uh, of some work I did with a, a customer, a pharmaceutical customer, um, their problem was that uh, they had double digit, or they still have double digit uh, growth, so it's kind of nice. Um, and they wanted to address some niche markets because they needed to feed their growth uh, and um, and plan for the future. But they had uh, they they could not really hire new teams because they were already hiring a lot. They could not deplete existing teams because they needed all the workforce for uh, their um, current business. So they could not address these niche markets. Um, so we had a. Um, we, we, we worked together um, and uh, what we came up with, uh, what they came up with and, and me facilitating the work was uh, that they uh, selected uh, a few niche market and they, um, they built virtual teams, uh, meaning they, they asked uh, to people in the organization to dedicate 20% of their time to this niche market uh, without leaving their existing, uh, their current um, department and their current location, by the way. So it was virtual team because uh, these team gathered through uh, electronic means. Um, and it was also ephemeral team because this team were, were to work until the niche market had grown uh, enough uh, for uh, the organization to hire a real team. So it was really ephemeral, virtual. Uh, it was uh, done, it's still done uh, thanks to the electronic um, tools. Uh, and it's, third of, uh, it, it's kind of a third dimension of the organization. Uh, so it was just an example of, uh, of what we, we can do with that. So this is what I wanted to, uh, to explain to you today. Uh, I'm done with the presentation. The only thing I would like to add is um, uh, doing the CCC was, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, very, uh, um, it's, it's kind of, a, you go through a life change, kind of, um, and uh, it gives you the, the virus of uh, researching. Uh, many, uh, many of us are still researching today. Um, and uh, this area is um, very close to what I am um, currently um, uh, doing uh, in terms of research. I'm researching on the impacts of uh, the, the, um, the digital transformation on uh, middle management. So probably in a few months I have a, a whole range of new things to explain and to, to share with, uh, with you. So I'm done with my presentation, and I uh, will now hand over to uh, to Gemma and to uh, Eileen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cecile. That was a fantastic presentation, really interesting. I know it's going to raise a lot of questions um, from the audience. But first of all, I'd like to go to Eileen to get your thoughts, Eileen, on the presentation. Um, so we're very much excited to hear about what you're going to say to us um, on that uh, on this presentation. Then we'll have a bit of a discussion around the Consulting and Coaching for Change programme. Eileen, can you hear me? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you, Gemma. Excuse, technology. We're talking about technology. <laughs> Thank you, Gemma and Cecile. Uh, yes, so so that was very interesting, and you know what Cecile presented uh, resonated quite a bit on a couple of points, particularly. And I'm just going to pull up some keywords here that really resonated with me because it touched upon work that I'm doing as well and, and the work that I did following CCC. One of them is collaboration. Um, so collaboration is a, is, is a big thing and I can definitely go into it a lot more and you know it, it, could, take, it, took, it could take me hours just to talk about collaboration itself. But um, I'll leave that to the questions uh, period. And the second one is uh, basically 
the fact that uh, Cecile also mentioned that the job roles have changed and she cited the Clue Tree Manifesto and that a lot of jobs will be obsolete but a lot of jobs in fact uh, may, may not be obsolete but may actually evolve into something quite different and uh, being from a communications background uh, for some years as well I've even seen that in, uh, you know, in, in, in strategic communications and in, in public relations and in marketing communications and so on, um, communicators or should I say professional communicators today are less of a manager and functional uh, communicators and they are more in fact if they, if they do their, their work right and they evolve with this digital changes in the world that Cecile talked about is that if they are becoming if they do their work well they're becoming more and more uh, importantly a policy guide uh, and a facilitator and coach in fact so they shouldn't be the ones doing the work in terms of uh, they shouldn't be the ones coming up with you know with the sound bites or drafting the speeches necessarily but they should certainly be the ones to uh, lead the way on defining what are the right policies to take the company or the brand or the spokesperson forward and to help guide and facilitate them uh, so that so that their personal style um, their, their personal style and their authenticity comes across with the right you know with the key messages that align with the vision and strategies of the, of the business. So that's kind of the, the, the two key points I thought really resonated well with me from Cecile's, um, from Cecile's uh, observation of the digital change. Fantastic. Thank you, Eileen. Cecile, did you have any comments to add to that? Um, well, it's, it's uh, um, I knew Arlene because uh, we've been uh, listening to a presentation of her on Smart Cities uh, recently in uh, one of our uh, gatherings. So uh, I think we, we share uh, kind of the same view on what is happening today that it's, uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, opportunities but uh, uh, there's also kind of a need uh, for change agent inside the organization or change agent like consultant like we are uh, to help with that because it's uh, it's happening whatever happened mm -hmm. uh, so it's happening even if uh, uh, let's say in in the very uh, negative uh, uh, situation the management does not want it it's happening anyway mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's better if it happens uh, with some facilitation with some help um, so that uh, the organization avoids the uh, the traps uh, and the uh, the warnings I mentioned mm. Yeah, and in fact, uh, if I may, uh, Gemma, uh, just to build on to Cecile's point here, and I think the other thing that Cecile mentioned as well is the context. The context is very, very important. And in CCC, we, that, you know, that really drives down the, the, how, we ref how we help reframe the context and how leadership needs to help reframe the context for people, right? So, so let's take collaboration, for example. As I said, I can talk hours about it but just to give an example co collaboration itself I mean a lot of people and this is really important in terms of getting the term getting the reference uh, right a lot of people inter um, well they kind of use uh, co the term collaboration very interchangeably with you know with cooperation with with coordination with partnerships right but what we really need to understand is that um, partnerships is a word to describe structures. It's a structure of working together. Cooperation is some form of working together, but it's more talking about the behavior of how, how you organize yourself so that you work with others. Uh, and coordination is the same. For me, in the research that I did, I mean, I've realized that collaboration, in fact, is none of that um, and can be all of that at the same time, but more importantly, collaboration is really a culture and an attitude. And, and because it's a culture and attitude, it also requires uh, a certain new set of skills 
that people don't associate with at the moment very much. Um, it's, it's a mindset that means that you need to have sort of an adaptive and agile leadership traits and skills. And that means at any level, I'm not just talking about upper senior level, I'm talking about any level. And some of these leadership and traits include things like, you know, being a good follower. So you have to have a good followership uh, skills or some people call that silent leadership. Uh, and then you've got to be able to be comfortable with power sharing um, because collaboration is such a dynamic, evolutive, um, I would say, um, interaction, right, and working together that at some phases you might find yourself having to lead and then at some phases you might find yourself having to really just hunker down and do the work and follow what others have to say because they know it better in that area. Um, and I think the final thing about collaboration is that, you know, whereas cooperation, you work for each, you, you work for yourself, so two parties can be working for themselves, but they could be working together in order to create some kind of outcome that benefits what we call a win-win. In collaboration, uh, it's really about uh, sharing your fate. So all the collaborators who work together actually has a unique fate. And so if one drops, the others will drop. So in fact, you're, you're more or less, uh, you have an interest to help the other person perform well because if not, you'll go down too, you see. So it's not even a win-win anymore. It just becomes one win in a sense. I, I don't know if that's kind of, you know, uh, makes sense. I oh, definitely just that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And there's something actually from my experience of speaking for with different participants here at the business school on a wide range of programs, not just the consulting and coaching for change program. It's the one thing that comes up time and time again is about collaboration and communication and how to really crack that challenge um, with organisations. And as you said, Eileen, from the leadership all the way through the, the organisation, it's not a specific hierarchy question. It's how can we make people collaborate together and it's very much harking back to what Cecile said, the human side of change and I think that's what's so apparent with the consulting and coaching change program that the human side of a business is the, really the crux of the issue um, and that actually leads us nicely onto a question. I think there's something um, we, we touched on the big the program itself, the consulting and coaching for change program at the beginning, but I know some people um, joined a little later. So I just wanted to give a, um, a summary really of the program for those that might not know what the program's about. And then to come to you, Cecile and Eileen, and talk to you about your experiences on the program. And then we can go back to some questions afterwards if you're both happy to do that. Yes, of course. Thank you. Sure, sure. Wonderful. So the Consulting and Coaching for Change program, I'm just going to bring up a slide that sort of summarize, summarizes even a few um, points and also the modules for you. And I'll go back to Cecile and Eileen's details so people can take a note of them afterwards. So the, the program itself is its transformational experience. And um, as Eileen and Cecile have been talking about, it's a way to um, look at change and be reflective as a practitioner, be that a consultant, be that a change agent within an organization, be that with um, someone that's working on change in an organization, perhaps in a human resources or a learning development perspective, and how can they lead change within those organizations around the world from all different sectors. Um, and I think the real beauty and the depth that comes from this program is the fact that we have participants from all over the world that come to Oxford and to Paris because we've done seven modules over a period of um, just over a year, um, or just under a year, should I say. So we're starting the first one in December this year. And then there's also an opportunity for you to undertake a specialised master's, um, which I know Cecile mentioned about her own dissertation that she undertook, and I believe Eileen has done the same. So it's an opportunity to learn from each other, to learn from the lecturers from Oxford and from Paris. And it is quite unique, a partnership program of this nature. And I think what really builds those conversations is being in two different locations with people all around the world, bringing different challenges, some of which are very similar, some of which are very different, but there's always different perspectives. Um, and I don't know whether Cecile and Eileen, whether you would echo that, or do you have a different point of view and observation on your experience of the program? 
Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, to me, uh, I took the CCC when I was leaving uh, GE, uh, and I decided to uh, start my own uh, business as a consultant. Uh, originally, I wanted to do uh, strategic marketing because I'm a, I'm a marketing person originally. Uh, and very, very quickly, it appeared to me that, uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry if I hit some marketing people on, on the phone, but basically uh, marketing become uh, le less and less interesting for me and change become, became more and more interesting. Um, it's, it's, uh, the, the program itself is very, very rich. Um, I've gained my first customer as a consultant uh, while I was doing that program. Uh, I used also my uh, dissertation to build up my, uh, my expertise on, uh, on some areas, uh, the enterprise 2.0 and collaboration and so on. Uh, and to uh, and to beca I became known as an expert through uh, thanks to the program and thanks to work I was doing in the program and, and sharing with uh, with my customers and with uh, uh, with other consultants. Uh, so it was very uh, trans it was a real personal transformation for me. Um, uh, as uh, as um, Gemma mentioned, I'm uh, today the chairperson for the. Uh, the change leaders, which is the um, the um, alumni organization, uh, which works as a uh, uh, community of practice, where uh, we we are doing continuous learning, we're sharing together, and we're, we're helping each other with uh, with our uh, projects. Uh, so uh, you, you kind of uh, fall in the best, uh, like we say in friend and friends, and you, you don't you don't get out, so you you, you get the virus. Of change, <laughs> so it's uh, it's really um, um, well a, a wonderful program. I would advise to uh, to anyone interested in change. And so Eileen, Eileen, maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I can echo what Cecile and Gemma has said to some extent, but of course from a personal perspective. Uh, in fact, when I when I decided to pursue CCC, what I've been doing before was. I was working in Cisco, but uh, specifically more focused on new areas like emerging sectors and and uh, a little bit aligned to what Sissy was talking about in the digital world. Uh, the group I worked for in Cisco, we were looking at innovative applications of where digital uh, could be applied. So things like uh, could we, for example, uh, bridge the gap and I mean physical gap and physical access for uh, for healthcare access, for example. So we ran, for example, a pilot in Argentina where we used uh, well the latest uh, you know video conferencing technology and what have you, collaborative tools and so on, to see if we could get a patient in the rural areas of Argentina talking with the pediatric, uh, pediatricians in uh, Buenos Aires, for example, and whether the diagnostics done through video, through that high resolution video uh, uh, collaborative tool would be the same as if the patient was right in the same room with, with the specialist and the specialist could touch the patient's, um, um, you know, and, and examine the patient physically. And uh, it was it was very exciting times in that sense. But what I noticed was that we were doing things very very quickly, and technology was really not the issue. Technology was always there was I mean there was always some problems as you know you know it's not always a hundred percent workable. But at the end of it, technology was not the wicked issue. As Cecile used the term, it was not the wicked issue because we could always find a solution to the problems in technology. What was the more wicked issue was really the fact that, you know, it was getting people to buy into it or getting them to change their behavior or getting them to accept it in such a way or getting them to um, think about it in such a way that they would, um, they would in fact, uh, change or make different decisions about policies or regulation and so on. So that's why I actually... Uh, enrolled into CCC thinking that 
I could understand a bit better and you know learning by methodologies and so on. But like Cecile said, I got more than what I expected because uh, because it became a personal change manifesto even for myself rather than you know just for the work that I do. And one of the things was to actually put myself into the equation of change and to look at it in the different contexts. And starting with starting with, for example, where people are and always putting them you know at the forefront. So uh, I was in marketing and communications as well, but um, it's not that I don't find it interesting anymore, but what what uh, CCC allowed me to do was actually to burrow deeper into marketing communications and not just look at the superficial levels, in fact. And, and so with the client work that I do today, um, I, I still work on, you know, helping them define uh, their marketing strategies, uh, looking into assessing what uh, the market trends are, where their stakeholders are, but I do it with a lot more uh, thoughtful thinking into the organization and into the capacity and capabilities of the team behind and of the whole organization and the individual behind uh, and not just looking at the strategy to execute. Okay. So, Fantastic, Arlene. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you so much for that answer. Then but to you, Cecile, for your thoughts on the program as well. Um, I wanted to go back now to a couple of questions we've had from the audience, actually. And the first one, I'll go to you, Cecile, first, if that's okay. Um, this mm -hmm. is from Kevin. He's had a couple of questions, but this is his first question is around, how, could you explain how the management retains control whilst encouraging the use of transitional tools? And the example he gave is, is a time where innovative thinking is important, but then focus is needed to implement the change. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's a wonderful question because it's really tricky. It's really tricky. Um, management somehow has to give up some control because you 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 cannot um, make the most of this digital world in a corporation or in an organization if you're not giving up some control. And it's it's really uh, difficult. It means um, giving uh, the people in your organization some power at the same level as their responsibility. So, so it's, it's not uh, the traditional uh, top-down pyramidal uh, command and control organization. It's a new kind of, uh, of leadership and management and it makes uh, things a bit difficult uh, to transition. So there's no, uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, there's no best practices in this area. There's only next practices, meaning we're building the solution. We don't have magic uh, bullets or that uh, easy to use. Um, um, there's there's some trust to develop as well as uh, kind of um, uh, I don't like the word control but it's that controlled processes meaning that you have to have processes in the organization for kind of a check and balance uh, on all the tasks or all the projects that uh, that means that uh, it does not mean that management will control everything. It means that um, people will welcome feedback on what they do and will allow control on what they do by uh, people that can help and give uh, interesting uh, advice. Uh, so it's not the top-down management control, it's a different kind of control in the organization that is kind of um, um, distributed, delegated. Thank you, that's fantastic. I hope that answers your question, Kevin. Um, if you do have any others, please do feel free to ask those. Um, one of the questions uh, has come through as well from a lady called Lorraine, um, Cecile. It might be something for yourself and for Eileen to add in as well. Um, the question is, what is your take on the rapid growth of fintechs and what can the established financial institutions do to remain competitive in this time of digital disruption? I'm sorry, uh, I'm not... Yeah, yeah, well, go ahead, yeah, go ahead. 
Sorry, Cecil. I was just saying uh, I'm not familiar with the term fintech. Financial, financial technologies, I guess. Is that right? I think so, yes. Okay, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Um, well, it's it's a bit of a a different a different question because um, I, I guess it's around ethics and um, um, how financial institution can be uh, competitive in in, in digital disruption. Um, I, I don't know if it's about Bitcoin or if it's about uh, uh, the fact that there's now robots uh, uh, buying uh, stock options and shares and things like <laughs> that. Um, I think it's a different discussion because it's, it's, it's about uh, putting back some ethics in a digital world um, and the word Unfortunately, the word competition and the word growth by any means does not really cope with ethics uh, most of the time, unfortunately. So um, I'd say we, we, we'd have to build uh, a new world where um, institution uh, exist because they they build a future uh, for uh, for everybody uh, rather than because they deliver um, growth and profit uh, to um, to themselves and to uh, to their um, to their shareholders um, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of uh, worried with, with the question sorry for that um, because um, it's 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 not a question I can really answer. I'm I'm, I'm not sure how. Uh, I'm not sure if it's really. Um, let's say that way. I'm not sure it's really mandatory to help financial institution to be more competitive because we're already in. Um, uh, you know the, the the blue ocean strategy and and the red ocean uh, concepts. We're we're kind of in a red ocean for financial institution and we are to find the blue ocean somewhere and the uh, think outside of the box way to, to work financial institution for them to, to help uh, to help the society rather than to, uh, to create more and more crisis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and the next question is around, uh, we talked earlier in the presentation, Cecile, around um, creating a transformative culture and um, ways to do that and tools to help with that. The questions around how can I persuade the board and the senior leadership to take on the idea of transformation and to take on the um, all the ideas around change and the ways that you could do that that you've highlighted. How can you put a business case forward that they would listen to and want to support? Well, if I may. Um... Mm, of course. I don't think uh, well, yes. and, may, and perhaps Cecile has a different approach. But in my in my case, I don't think it's a question of building a transformation case uh, to take to the board. Um, I think that uh, the the transformation has to be inculcated into uh, the overall organization. Uh, in some ways, uh, little by little, because, I mean, uh, let me put it another way. If you go to the board of directors and you come up and say, you know, we need a big, we need a transformation uh, plan um, and it's going to do this and that and so on and so forth. Well, either first it's going to scare them off or two, you're going to, you're going to put yourself up for basically uh, disappointment because you're going to put so much pressure on what this transformation is going to be expected to do in some ways. Um, but as we know, every change actually is, as, and Cecile pointed to this during her presentation, is that every change goes through phases. It's not like, oh, we're going to do a transformation plan and we're going to execute it, and in the next six months or the next one year even, uh, it's, we're going to create that transformation and this is the outcome. Uh, in fact, most times, and that's also one of the reasons why I'm not sure if the statistics still apply, but uh, 
this has been repeated a few times that 70% of change programs don't work. Only 30% actually work. And this has been the same statistic for the last 20 years. It hasn't improved. And that's because people think of, oh, big transformation and then, you know, we're going to get this outcome. In actual fact, in change, the point is that uh, it's, it's a face-by-face -face thing, it's an attitude thing, and I think uh, when Cecile said she was working with middle management, uh, I totally agree with her. Because the problem with our traditional top-down hierarchy and command and control type organizations, organizational structures today, is that we have, we've dumbed down the people below the, the so-called leadership. Uh, it's only the leaders, apparently, who seem to have all the say or who seem to have all the knowledge or who seem to have all the intelligence to make the right decisions. But that's not, that's not true. Uh, so we, by dumbing down the rest, of the, uh, the rest of the people or the rest of the levels, we're actually telling them, and this is true of governments as well, we are actually telling them, don't worry, we the leaders will take care of things. Uh, you just work hard and we'll tell you what to do. If you follow us, you'll be fine. That's not true. It's, it's more a question of empowering them, helping them understand that they actually can take action into their own hands, even if they are followers, because as a follower, you can pick the leader you want to follow, and that is being an active follower. Um, and then, basically, uh, you know, you, you start with there and you turn it into a culture, right? And then potentially if you really want to do big transformative type of stuff like, uh, uh, say, adopting a whole new technology or adopting a whole new process, it becomes easier because the culture has already been um, ingrained in the organization. It takes longer, for sure. I mean, it's going to take, you know, it, it, it will take longer, but I don't think there's an easy, fast step to it. I don't know. Do you agree, Cecile? Well, um, and, uh, I, I would turn that the other way around because I've been working in that area and I had that question quite often. Uh, if, if I understand well, the question it is how do you convince your executive committee or executive management that you need to go there? Um, and I, I, well, it's, uh, it's kind of a heavy uh, uh, responsibility or a heavy workload to do that. What I do now uh, with customer, because I still get the question very, very often, is two steps. One step is awareness, building awareness. So you do a, an awareness day or an awareness workshop two days with the executive committee. Uh, so the difficult thing is to convince them to dedicate a day or half a day or two days into uh, a kind of a deep dive uh, into what is digital, the digital world, and what you can do with that, what does it mean, what are the new business models, and so on. So but usually it's very, very, uh, people are very, very happy with this kind of uh, awareness uh, workshop. So I have my own specific um, uh, tools to do that uh, with creating think tank times and things like that and introducing um, other experts and so on. And then that, that, that the first step, awareness of the executive committee. And then you have to find a real tricky issue in the organization and say, I will deal with that with through uh, digital tools uh, and use collaboration and use uh, maybe I don't know crowdsourcing or a jam or I don't know what kind of tool you can use but use um, use digital tools for that so it can be can be very useful I, I remember Alstom for example had to rejuvenate their uh, their um, learning um, their business university and what they did was to uh, allow any kind of employee to film very short videos uh, through mobile phone any kind of a uh, um, low-level technology, did not need a, a, a high-end camera and so on, um, and to post that into kind of a, uh, their own YouTube, internal YouTube uh, channel, uh, and um, they, they created um, 
hundreds and hundreds of videos that they, uh, they the university helped translate in many languages because uh, it's a multinational and anyone uh, does not speak English, so they created those short videos with their mobile phones in their languages. Uh, they posted that uh, into the uh, the the uh, Alstom YouTube, um, and it created a, an entire new way to, uh, to, to share learning across the organization uh, and uh, rejuvenating the, uh, the, um, the um, tra traditional uh, corporate university, and it really was a, was a big success. Thank you. Um, yeah, sorry. No, sorry. No, it's fantastic. Thank you, Cecile and Eileen. That, that's really it's really good to have different perspectives on dealing with that challenge because you're absolutely right. It's a really it's a tough and a big ask and a big piece of work, as you said, Cecile. And it's good to have a, a proper real life example as well of how that can work in an organization and the different tools that you've been through and talked about today um, gives you a chance, gives people an understanding of some of the ways they might be able to do that. So thank you both of you. Um, I'll go to the last question now, unless there's any others from the audience. And this is to you, Cecile, but Eileen, you might want to mention your thoughts as well. Um, it's from Kevin and he said, what's the return on your investment from the program cost? And have you calculated what the payback period was when you initially set out to do the CCC program and since um, graduating? Okay, well, I went to this program not with a, um, um, a business case. <laughs> well, I had a business case because I needed to make sure I had money to pay for the program, of course. Uh, but basically, I, I made the decision to go at midlife, maybe midlife crisis, I don't know, or midlife change, <laughs> I would say. I, I made the decision to go to a program, so I asked myself, should I go to an MBA or should should I go to to this kind of program? I I, I, I tried uh, I, I researched on several programs, and my rationale was uh, given my uh, my age. Or to be very clear, I was uh, uh, 45 something, uh, I guess. Uh, given my age, given my career, I was one, I was starting my own business, so I was not anymore in a corporation. And given what I wanted to do, be a consultant and help organization, but change, uh, change, have different customer, different projects, and so on. The MBA was uh, definitely not the right choice for me, at least. Uh, also because uh, when I was young, I did a business school, so the MBA was kind of a uh, replay of what I learned when I was young, even though it's it's a bit uh, old oldish. But uh, so I made the choice for the CCC. Uh, the return, uh, as I said, it, it allowed me uh, to to. To find my first customer, to um, to have all the tools, uh, to, um, to 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 view uh, the the business uh, from a different uh, way. So uh, the intangible are huge and uh, very positive. On the tangible, uh, they um, in I, I guess in how long did I make back the money I put and the time I put in that program? It's a bit difficult to say, but I would say maybe, I don't know, three to five years, I would say, uh, something like that. So, uh, but I honestly, uh, I made the decision to go for, a, for a, a master, an executive master, and the issue was more choosing the right one than, than um, making sure that it could recover the cost. Um, I don't know, Eileen, if you how you did uh, think about it. <laughs> Actually, it's a very interesting question, but you, you're right. I didn't go into the program because a lot of people ask me, of course, when I ask for advice whether I should pursue the program, they ask me, well, would you do you think you could recuperate the cost, or you know, do you, did you calculate your return on? Would you be able to calculate a return on investment and to be honest I wasn't able to not at the beginning and um, so I actually pursued it uh, not for the return on investment I figured that well if nothing else I would at least learn something useful and I would learn something from two great uh, you know business institutions in Europe 
uh, and there was nothing to lose in that sense. Although, of course, I would have to work harder to, to gain back. But in all honesty, I really wanted to uh, put a figure to it now because it's been about a year after I graduate. I would say I've already recuperated the cost. Um, it's already break even. If if you if you the, the simple answer is it's break it's broken even for me. I've recuperated the cost, uh, but on the intangible side, I think there's been a lot more value in the sense that it's allowed me to pursue uh, research. It's allowed me to pursue learning. I, I'm continuing to to even experiment with stuff. Uh, I'm I've already run two pilots on my collaborative leadership structures in two different types of organizations and that in itself for me is um, you know it goes beyond it goes beyond monetary re uh, recovery thank you both you that's that's really interesting to hear those perspectives i know it's a very difficult question and it's 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 a considerable investment um, both monetary and both time wise but the fact that you both feel that it's had I think the value outside of the monetary element is probably the most um, interesting, the most rewarding, and sort of how it's changed your uh, business lives and business working lives from your own business perspective, as well as how you can see it affecting the way that you work in the future as well. So thank you, both of you. I'm going to go to the last question now, which actually um, is with you, Cecile, so it relative, relates rather to your previous point about how you can persuade a board to support a change program or transformation. And this is from um, Jana, and Jana's asked, suggesting that after the awareness workshop that you mentioned, how would you secure continuous commitment from the management or from the board? Um, okay, well, the, the, the thing is to very quickly find that, um, that uh, pilot project you will um, run through digital tools a pilot change project. Uh, so find this pilot even before the awareness day. Uh, you, you need to have an idea of that. And the awareness day should be uh, also the location and the time to uh, have the executives speak about their uh, speak together about their issues and and decide which kind of issue they would like to run through uh, this uh, this new tools or this new model of, uh, of change management. Uh, and then if you have the project, pilot project, does not need to be uh, big, but it needs to be strategic, it needs to be important, it needs to be uh, futuristic, I would say, uh, uh, for the organization, or, or tricky, or wicked, uh, meaning important, not big, but important. If you have this project, if you can make sure you have one sponsor in the executive committee, then you have uh, you have continuous commitment from the management because because you'll have you'll have a channel to report to them. You'll have someone from the executive committee uh, who will want to have uh, information and know how it's going and so on. So uh, it, it's really the way. It's it's really the two steps I was mentioning: one awareness and two uh, uh, a small wicked project to start with. Thank you, Cecile. Thank you. That's very helpful to elaborate on that point. Um, we've now come to the end of the webinar now. I wanted to thank you, Cecile, and you, Eileen, for your contribution the presentation. I, I'm sure everybody will agree in the audience. It's been really interesting, very informative, um, and it's it really opened up a lot of questions and discussions, some of which we probably haven't had a chance to get to today, uh, which is always a nice situation in a way. Um, I'll be able to answer any questions afterwards that come in um, in the next couple of minutes um, in the email coming out to all attendees attendees early next week, I would imagine by Monday. Um, that will also include the slides and the recording of the webinar so that you can listen to it afterwards and take in each point and will also include the contact details for Cecile and for Eileen and for Oxford and HEC in Paris um, to discuss the consulting and coaching for change program in more detail as well as topics around this particular webinar. Um, so thank you again Cecile and Eileen, I hope you've enjoyed it as well. Oh, yes, tremendously. Thank you, Gemma. Thank you, Cecile, and thank you the, to the audience for listening. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody, and Gemma, for organizing that, and Eileen to be with us. It was, uh, it was a, a nice uh, sharing time. <laughs> yes, indeed. I'll speak to you soon, Cecile. Thank you. Have a lovely afternoon and a good weekend, everyone. You thank too. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.